still. I, I'm in the afternoon. I'm on the East Coast, or actually Central Time. Uh, we will be talking about close-range photogrammetry versus 3D scanning for archaeological documentation. The paper is by Katie Simon, but she could not be here today, and Fred Limp will be presenting the paper for her. Uh, Fred is a, the Leica and Geosystems Chair and University Professor at the University of Arkansas. He is the Director Emeritus for the Center for Advanced Spatial Technology and is currently serving as the President of the Society for American Archaeology. Fred. Well, good afternoon, and both uh, Katie is in Cyprus on a project and Rachel in Italy on a project, and so I am here with you today. Looking forward to reviewing with you some of the really interesting, I have no idea what's happened. Excuse me. Okay, we are, are talking today about a variety of different methodologies, and as was pointed out yesterday, quite appropriately, it's just a tool. Uh, but remember, if you have tools, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so one of the questions that we need to ask is, which tool? <laughs> and when do we use it? And how do I, perhaps a person not intimately involved with the technology, understand which selections to make? What we need, I would suggest, is the whole 3D catalog. It seems since I happen to be here in San Francisco, that's an, um, a good analogy, with my apologies to Stuart Brand, and some of you may know what that means, and some of you may not know what that means. In any event, uh, what I'm about to talk about here next is a little bit of a start towards that. Before we get into it, just to give you a little bit of our bona fides so that you have a sense of whether or not we actually know what we're talking about, uh, the group that I'm representing, that Katie and Rachel are part of, is a research unit in the University of Arkansas. Uh, we primarily focus on geoinformatics, geomatics, computational sciences, heritage applications, or a portion of our interest, probably about a fifth, something like that. We also look at issues of interoperability, archive, and what have you, uh, and we have a reasonably sizable staff looking at that. I was going back to a little bit of our background in photogrammetry. I realized in 1996 we received an NCPTT grant to do close-range photogrammetry, which back then was not quite the easy task that it is today. Uh, and we actually were modifying a Leica, uh, well, then Zeiss, image station, which was used for aerial uh, remote uh, uh, photogrammetry for close-range photogrammetry. By the way, the report's still there. Um, in terms of our scanning background, our first instrument that we purchased was in 2003, not terribly long ago, was an Optech Ilris, which by the way, uh, if you are interested in large things, the Optech remains today one of the best long range terrestrial systems that actually goes out to easily 800 meters uh, and can do a kilometer to a kilometer and a half in good conditions. Uh, we've added then a number of other systems to that. Work with a broad range of software, obviously Cyclone, but also RapidForm, OptiCat, Polyworks, a variety of the others, a lot of open source mesh lab uh, and others as well. And there's one little thing I put at the bottom, a key part of, in my opinion, when we're looking with structural laser scanning and photogrammetry is control. Uh, we have had a lot of discussions about projects. Most of those appear to be in site coordinates things are actually out there in the real world, and they are in geodetic space. And I would suggest that one of the things we need to think about is putting in actual geodetic control in our various activities. Now that raises a little bit of a problem. Some of the software doesn't like big numbers. For those of you involved in GIS for a long time or other things, you know, we always had 8-bit data and how did we deal with that. It still seems that a lot of the um, um, point cloud software doesn't like big long numbers. So geodetic uh, numbers can be a problem, but nevertheless I would submit that uh, survey control is a key aspect of whether it's photogrammetry or laser scanning. This is sort of how we look at the whole area of uh, 3D development. We talk about a 3D ecosystem with a variety of different pieces and parts, and I want to mention two in particular. We haven't been talking much about that, but semantic decomposition, that is the extraction of actually useful information out of these unorganized data sets is a very important task. It's really hard. <laughs> it's a computationally interesting problem, and we really need to deal with it. And the other one is an archive. We've talked about that. I want to come back to this a little bit later on. If we look at sort of a very simplified 3D data pipeline, we see that actually laser, and I use that term with 
air quotes always, laser scanning and photogrammetry is actually very similar in many respects. And it's to this measure, draw, vector, analyze product that we're looking at when we're talking about this entire workflow. So we're trying to get somewhere. Now, if we break that down, this is just an example of a close range photogrammetry workflow. There's an awfully lot of, I don't know if you can see all of the decision points. There's a lot of parameters and I wanna make this point very clear. We've talked about acquisition and obviously acquisition is very important and there are parameters that you set during acquisition but there are an enormous number of parameters that are involved in these software packages uh, that uh, can alter the results during processing. However, we're lucky. Generally speaking, the defaults <laughs> in many instances are adequate. So on the other hand, in some instances they aren't. So we would encourage really thinking through the structure of the various parameter selection. Now, with that very uh, superficial background, how do you decide? How do you choose which of the two alternatives? Well, here are a few parameters that you might look at. You know, how much does it cost? Uh, how far away are you working? Uh, what's the depth of the information you're trying to capture? Is it lit? <laughs> Obviously, uh, photogrammetry doesn't work in the dark. Laser scanning, in many instances, actually does. Uh, what are the goals, though? The, the one at the bottom is really, uh, I think, the key uh, uh, essential point, and we want to look at that as we go forward. But how do we measure whether or not these particular uh, methods achieve our goal? So before I actually get into that, I want to make one point here, which I, which I find kind of interesting. What you're seeing here is, is basically a semi-real-time vector acquisition of a 3D data set. Turns out it's a um, structure and defiance cave, which is actually a park service uh, data set. We did a pre and post stabilization uh, metric analysis. Uh, and so essentially you can bring the data back, you can vectorize it, and then you have 3D vectors, which are different than 2D vectors. Now obviously it's possible to flatten these into some sort of planimetric data, but I just want to point out that two-dimensional data loses <laughs> its three-dimensional character. And particularly when you're looking at things like stabilization, it may actually be movement in that Z surface that actually is the difference between the two condition states. Something to be thinking about as we go forward. Okay. So here's the question. I have two data sets. I have two ways of accomplishing a particular goal. How do I compare those? And we've seen one excellent example, Tom's demonstration of the way in which the metrics of the two data sets were compared. That's the traditional geomatics surveying way to look at three-dimensional data. We measure how far apart they are. Well, that's a perfectly valid and perfectly useful way to go about doing it. But in fact, it may obscure or overlook information of significance to a particular disciplinary focus. For example, uh, stylistic components in a particular object may look <laughs> metrically the same in two different data sets, but be quite different. And so we're finding that computer vision and gaming metrics can be very effective measures of is that data good enough? Because that's the fundamental question we're asking. Is the data that I'm acquiring good enough to do X? <laughs> well, what is X? And if X is a stylistic analysis, for example, of particular motifs or features, have I acquired the data at that level in order to accomplish my goal? Hmm. Okay, I don't know why this is, but we seem to have mouse problems. By the way, have you noticed that we're all up here talking about how computers are gonna change our life for the better and the projection systems hardly ever worked in? So just a question. So uh, this is a particular case study we, we, this is th we cheated here. We said, what should we really use a C10 to scan a set of particular rock art features at a site, megalithic site in Ireland, or should we use photogrammetry? Now we're taking the C10 at its absolute maximum extent. So this is, we knew the answer to this question, but nevertheless. So here we have a data set. So here we have a data set. This is the traditional metric comparison. This is the data as acquired through processing through photogrammetry and the data as acquired from the C10. And basically, the long story short, is they're the same, okay? Uh, there's very little difference except at the margins and that's not surprising. But 
that's, we're not really interested in sort of the overall physical dimensions of the rock art. We're actually interested in the motifs and the particular stylistic components. So here's two representations. How do you measure, did the stylistic component appear in the data? You know, how do you do that? That's not an easy question. You can look at it. You can say perhaps it does. Well, one way to do it is to look at some saliency metrics coming out of the computer vision community. And so essentially what you do here is you built a kernel. In this case, the kernel happens to be seven millimeters. And you pass the kernel across the image and you look at the two images. You can see the photogrammetric derived point cloud. You can see the scanning and it's, well, they're pretty good. They're not too bad. If we pass a five millimeter kernel, you can see the differences in the data. And if we pass a three millimeter kernel, and again, we're cheating. Uh, the, the, there's no way on earth that a C10 goes down to three millimeters. I mean, you're beyond noise. Uh, but the point is, is you can see here that we actually have a metric that tells us that if the objective of the analysis was to recover data at this particular level of uh, quality, if you will, we are able to do it with method A, and we cannot do it with method B. And again, we can apply the same logic to any sort of comparative processes. The point we're trying to make here is published numbers, you know, the unit works at six millimeters or what have you, or the pixel size is 0.02, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, is, is the information content of the data meeting the objectives and goals that we're looking at? And there are ways to measure that. Now, here's another way. So here we have a case, photogrammetry scanning. Photogrammetry is the, uh, is the uh, uh, desired goal. So now we're going to compare structured light scanning to a variety of photogrammetric methods. And as everybody's been talking about, there's a bunch of them out there, 1, 2, 3D catch, uh, photo scan, photo modeler, and so on and so forth. And so what we're doing in the next process is we're looking at how these two compare. We're again, we're back to a traditional surveying or geomatic, geomatics measurement. We're looking at the Hasdorff distance, which is a it's not just exactly how far things are apart. It's a bit more complicated than that. But essentially, it's a metric that's well understood that will tell you whether two data sets are alike or different. Long story short, they are pretty much similar. There is a variation here, uh, but it probably has to do with just the way the things work. The one, one of the data sets is from the Broichmann. The Broichmann is a very high-end uh, structured light scanner. And the other is a photo scan. By the way, the camera was a Canon. Um, um, 5D Mark II with a 21.1 megapixel full uh, frame uh, sensor. Yeah, all processed through a variety of different softwares. So here's another way to look at it the same way. In other words, are these two the same? Have they measured the same information? So we looked at the traditional metric analysis and we said, well, yeah, they're pretty similar. But let's look at it again using some of these computer vision methods. What we're looking at here is a, the photo scan and there's some parameters that you can set at photo scan, as we've talked a little bit about. So there's what's called a lower power smooth, a high power smooth, and what have you. And then in the, I guess it's, it's your right, <laughs> is the actual Broichmann data. And again, the image, I think, tells you the story, and that is, is the Broichmann is obviously recovering key information content that we need for the particular analysis that we're involved with. We can quantify that, but uh, the picture, pictures <laughs> tell a thousand words, essentially. So again, we have a particular computational method that allows us to say A, not B. Here's another example, and particularly, uh, this is particularly significant. Uh, a lot of photogrammetric methods, when you're looking at uniform materials, you've got metal, you've got some other things that have specular characteristics. Sometimes the automated point matching systems have a lot of trouble finding key points whereas a structured light system, in this case, obviously, is applying a pattern to the surface. So in particular material cases, system A may be better than system B. Again, uh, I won't bore you with the math, but there are actual metrics that we can say, well, in fact, this is better than that for the following metric reason. Another example here, these are um, some amphora stamps. We've actually been looking at amphora stamp um, um, erosion. Uh, as in four were, were made, they, uh, the s they were stamped, and as you get further along, the stamps actually wear out, so you really need to have a lot of detail. So here's, in the photographic data is the same as before. Here's the data in 1, 2, 3D catch with texture. Oh, it doesn't look too bad. 
Without texture, there's really no 3D data there. <laughs> there's texture data. Uh, it, however, with the PhotoScan products, we do have uh, quite a bit. Uh, here's another little bit of an example. Long story short, applying the similar metrics that we looked at before, the Broichmann and the PhotoScan with a standard Canon camera are essentially similar information content. Why get a $150,000 scanner uh, if uh, the camera will work? So we could look at these. I'm not going to go through the details. There are pluses and minuses of these various particular strategies in photogrammetry for the sorts of reasons that you're seeing. I want to jump ahead to another point. I think this is very important, and that is, is that we have, even though we have a lot of interesting digital recording methods, we still have silos. Data type A is in silo A. Data type B is in silo B. They are not in similar coordinate systems. They are not organized. They're not brought together. They're typically looked at by individual specialists. It's not always that bad. <laughs> but I would strongly urge a consideration for using some integrated management. What you're seeing here, by the way, is ArcGIS 10.1. Yes, it doesn't handle large point clouds that are ginormous, but what you can do is you can put reduced versions of those point clouds in a similar coordinate system into ArcGIS, which then links back to the full resolution products and so on and so forth. For those of you in the built environment, uh, Autodesk, Bentley, doing similar sorts of things, point clouds in Revit and stuff, I think it is essential that all of these data are brought together in a common coordinate and a similar software environment. The other thing I think that's absolutely essential, we've talked a little bit about this, what are we going to do about archives? Actually, people have already done a great deal about archives around the world, and there are many institutions that have these archives. I would argue, and I mean no disrespect to the private sector, I actually work there a lot myself, the private sector is not particularly a good environment for long-term uh, archival purposes. Uh, we need institutions, whether they're universities, whether they're government agencies and what have you, that create their a trusted repository is a term of art, by the way, so that has certain re uh, characteristics. There are already a number of these that are out there uh, in Europe, the ADS, here in the United States, the Digital Archaeological Record, there are others uh, that meet these requirements. The Mellon uh, Foundation is putting a lot of resources into trusted digital archives for a variety of different domain areas. A couple of other things about archives. It is essential, in my opinion, that the raw, unprocessed data is placed in the archive, that the processed stack is placed in the archive, what you do to it, and not just the final digital objects. We've talked about ownership and stuff. There's a solution to that. It's called Creative Commons licensing. There's Creative Commons 1, 2, 3, and so on. All of our data is Creative Commons 3, unless otherwise uh, specified. I also mentioned persistent URIs. You need to be able to get back to digital data. You can't be moving it around. You have to be able to find it. The other thing that's important about archives is metadata. And we've talked about how do we record it, but how do we process it? This is a little piece <laughs> of uh, our laser scanning workflow process metadata structure. So in other words, what do you record when you do this? What do you record? What are the meshing parameters that you use? What were the hole filling algorithms that you used? And so on and so forth as you move from one to the other. Uh, at the Archaeological Data Services and data, uh, the Digital Antiquity, there is a comprehensive document about laser scan metadata, all of the field acquisition characteristics, the process acquisition characteristics. There are similar requirements or specifications for close range photogrammetry. A number of folks have been mentioning that we need to be thinking about these. I would encourage you to look at the ADS website, uh, steal it, it's public. Uh, there's a great deal of information. This is just a little bit of a piece of it. So, some conclusions. Uh, well, obviously, uh, we've talked a lot about processing, but post-processing and the modifications that you make to the data are essential. Generally speaking, those process stack operations are not captured. Uh, we have the results, and we've even said, and we understand in the commercial sector, it's the result that's the product to be turned over to the client. Absolutely understood, not a problem. When heritage recordation of public resources that will be around for a long time are involved, we have a different set of responsibilities and requirements, I would argue. And that is, is that we need to be able to return to original data from some time in the past, compare, look at condition changes, look at these sorts of things, so that not only the product 
but the actual raw data and the process, so perhaps we tweak parameters, we can change things. There's no question that in the appropriate circumstances, 3D scanning, photogrammetry, both have very powerful and significant goals. We need to determine what is our metric, and it should not be three millimeters or whatever. It has to be what's the information content that we're trying to achieve at the end. And oh, by the way, we need three millimeters to get there. And first of all, it's essential. It is uh, absolutely required that in the field that the appropriate metadata and process metadata are recorded and made part of the archive information. So stay hungry, stay foolish is an objective that uh, we had back then, and I think it's still entirely appropriate. And one final comment I'll call to your attention. We've been able to develop a lot of these process analyses and the other aspects that I've talked about here today as a result of a multi-year, fairly substantial NSF grant. And so there's gmb.cast.uart.edu, and you, it's a still under development. We've got about another six months before the money runs out, and of course we're trying to get everything done in the next six months. But in any event, uh, you can see workflows. You can go in and say, I have this particular objective, click on it, it will take you to a discussion of a scanner selection criteria. Click on that, it will take you to what are the parameters that you need to set for hole filling and so on and so forth. Again, not all there, uh, please bear with us, uh, but uh, do encourage you to visit the site. Thank you very much. <laughs>